we'll quit poking the old man so go back to sleep when we get back to beautiful weekend weather we've got a show today on the kim hammer show where i've got more content than i got time so i hope that you're ready to listen very quickly i've got two great guests on today one is dole webb the former chairman of the republican party of arkansas that is running for lieutenant governor's office and then in the second half hour I've got Dr. Greg Bledsoe, who also is running for the lieutenant governor's office, and we're going to have a little bit of a one-on-one interview with each of these gentlemen. I want to do a couple public service announcements about a couple, couple, I'm sorry, a couple events that are coming up that uh, you need to get on your calendar because they're this weekend. The first one is tomorrow. It's the Heart of Arkansas Beats for Life. It's the 44th annual March for Life that's going to be held tomorrow, Sunday. At 2 o'clock, and this event is still scheduled. The weather should be fine uh, to be able to come out. It might be a little cold, but dress warm. The march will begin at Capitol Avenue and Wolf Street. Uh, Staging is between Battery Street and Wolf Street on the West Capitol Avenue behind the Capitol. Reserved parking for seniors, disabled, or families with small children will be available on Wolf Street. All others plead park on the open lots from Marshall to Summit or in front of the Capitol. No parking will be allowed behind the Capitol along the March Life route. And uh, please follow the sidewalk along 7th Street to reach the staging area. If you got questions, you can call 501-663-4237 or visit ARTL, Arkansas Right to Life, dot org, ARTL dot org. This event has been going on for multiple years, and given the fact that the Supreme Court has one of the greatest decisions before them that they'll have to make between now and June, uh, it will be more important than ever that people show up to support pro-life and to be present in order to uh, be there for those that can't be, which would be those that were aborted. So I encourage you to be there uh, tomorrow at uh, 2 o'clock is when it begins. That's the heart of Arkansas Beats for Life. Now, the next thing I want to share with you is, before we get Dole on the line, is that tonight at 6 o'clock at the Church Up Hatster, which is Saline Baptist Church in the community of Tull, that's T-U-L-L, uh, outside of Benton, about 10 minutes, not a far drive at all, we are going to be doing a sportsman's supper. Our speaker is going to be Dr. Sonny Tucker, who is the executive director of the Arkansas State Convention. He's also an avid outdoorsman. And uh, as far as the menu, we're going to have a variety, uh, some for those that are on the daring side and those that are on the more conservative side. Uh, We'll have raccoon, we have beaver, uh, we have gumbo, we also uh, will have catfish, and we have uh, pork butts, potato salad, baked beans, and uh, the meal is actually complimentary. If you want to make a donation, that would be great. Uh, We are going to be giving out some great door prizes uh, tonight. And also, uh, we've got some great mounts uh, that if you want to take a look at some really good mounts from bobcat to bear to uh, uh, deer and, uh, you know, uh, ducks and fish and all of the above, it's going to be a great time tonight. Now, I do want to tell you, we're going to check temperatures at the door. And last night, we had our cleaning company. They came in and sanitized the building for COVID. And so we've taken every precaution that we can so you can come out in a safe family environment tonight. Doors will open at 530 and the uh, supper will be at 6, and Dr. Sonny Tucker will bring a, a challenging thought around 7 o'clock. And as I said, we have a lot of door prizes. I'll give you more about that later. You can go up to the website, thekimhammershow.com, and get more information or go up to my personal Facebook page. A lot of sponsors that are helping make that event possible tonight. Uh, Senator Matt Pitch, who's running for treasurer. Senator Alan Clark, um, going to have, uh, if she's able to be there, State Representative Mayberry. Uh, we had uh, uh, Phillips Baxley Mowdy uh, is a uh, table sponsor, Big Red, the Kim Hammer Show. Um, we've just got a lot of sponsors, so we got a lot of good gifts to give away tonight. All right, we got a lot to pack into the show for the Kim Hammer Show today. My first guest is a Saline County resident, longtime friend of mine also, and we've got him on today to talk about his run for the Lieutenant Governor race. And uh, to help you and help bring our state and Saline County up to uh, to great heights. Very good. All right. Just name but out. But uh, let me just open up the mic to let them tell them about your experience as far as the world of politics. 
Well, you know, uh, Kim, I practiced law for 25 years in, in Benton and uh, had r- rental rental property, both commercial and residential. And uh, even our family owned a, a flower shop for years. But I was drawn into politics back uh, uh, when when we our state was fully dark blue, and I was elected the first Republican. Uh, in Saline County, since 1874, I was elected to the Quorum Court, uh, and then uh, you know we haven't elected a Democrat in Saline County now in over 10 years. So I felt like I helped change our our community down there. I was then elected to the state Senate, uh, the first Republican from Saline and Perry counties. Served two terms as the law required at the time. Uh, fought to reduce the used car tax, and we did uh, change it fought to uh, pass the first uh, ban on partial birth abortion, and we did do that, even though there were just seven Republicans of 35 in the House, in the Senate, and 11 in the House. And then I, uh, uh, after a, a period of time, uh, I felt called to serve as chairman of the state Republican Party, and I was elected to that position in 2008. Uh, at a time when Arkansas was once again dark, dark blue, Barack Obama had been elected. I served for 12 years, and we we changed this state to a bright red Republican state with uh, uh, super majorities in the House and the Senate. Over 50 percent of our people, uh, elected officials in the counties, are now Republican. Uh, all of our constitutional officers are Republican, and our federal delegation is Republican. Uh, I'm proud of that achievement, and I'm proud of the fact that we built the nicest headquarters in the state, in the nation, and it dedicated debt-free. I presided over 12 ballots budgets and 12 clean audits, and left the the state party with over $250,000 uh, in the bank. So what have you been doing in your uh, spare time? <laughs> well, you know, in my spare time, I worked for Wynn Rockefeller for about five years uh, during the time he was lieutenant governor. And I, I have always felt uh, a kinship to that office and to Wynn uh, because I served there for uh, 1,500 days. Uh, during his illness and then his death, I actually closed the office. So, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've been blessed to love my state and work hard for my state and always listen to the people around the state. We're going to talk about some current issues because one thing I find that whenever somebody gets interviewed that's running for office is, you know, we got a list of stage questions, and I've, obviously I've got some too. But I think how you answer certain questions about issues that are relevant to today also reveals a little bit into your philosophy and being the lieutenant governor, uh, you're next in line. God forbid something should happen to the next governor, uh, but you have to be willing and able uh, and prepared to step up in the event the governor should be absent. Um, you know, we, we pass that law where a governor can be out of the country and still be acting governor because of technology. But if the governor sure. became incapacitated, you would be the one that would step up. And I think it's important, you know, for people to know and to hear how you answer certain questions about things that are relevant today. But let me ask you just a few simple things. First of all, uh, what do you think it is that other than your long list that you just gave a while ago, what is it that you feel makes you the candidate to be the next Lieutenant governor of the state of Arkansas? Well, Senator, I think it's several things. Uh, on two occasions, I've been called on by Lieutenant governors to uh, advise them at critical times in our state's history. The first time was uh, Mike Huckabee was lieutenant governor, and Jim Guy Tucker refused to resign after he was convicted of bankruptcy fraud. Uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, Lieutenant Governor Huckabee called on me to ask me what he could do to get uh, get him out of office, to get Jim Guy out of office. The second time occurred when Lieutenant Governor Rockefeller was in office, and our country was uh, hit with terrorists in New York on 9-11, Lieutenant Governor Rockefeller called me once again and said, B, 
Doyle, I'm now governor. Governor Huckabee's out of state. What can I do as the acting governor? So on two occasions, the acting governor has actually called on me to be helpful in that regard. I think with today's uh, situation, the fact that I have helped elect every Republican in the House and in the Senate I feel like I can be a fair arbiter. I feel like I can be helpful behind the scenes. I feel like I can be a good counselor and critic, if need be, uh, in private with our new governor, Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Uh, I feel like my, my tenure in the party and my relationship with her and her family would lend me to being a good counselor. I also plan on being a full-time lieutenant governor, even though the office only requires part-time work and is only paid as a part-time employee. I feel like if you're at the Capitol, you can serve people well and you can serve the other elected officials well. My, my goal is to make a difference in that office and to help move Arkansas forward. All right. And to that point, the lieutenant governor, while a separate constitutional office, uh, pretty well serves under the leadership and, for the most part, answers to the governor. And, you and, you know, you got to be a team player with the governor. In fact, there's been conversations in the past that the governor and lieutenant governor ought to be a ticket together. So you vote one, you vote the other, like we do with the presidential what do you feel that you are going to have the capabilities to do and what would be your passions that you would want to work on uh, if elected as lieutenant governor, knowing that you have to play nice, for lack of a better term, with the governor? Well, I, th I think priority is you are a team member with the governor. Uh, I would like to see and help her pass her agenda and to be a silent uh, critic uh, in the rooms of the, the cabinet room of the, of the governor if she needs advice, uh, a critical analysis of what she's about. Uh, I believe that's important. I believe it's important that we continue a conservative Republican agenda, and that would be to help and facilitate uh, senators and uh, representatives, if called on, to help them pass those agenda items. My, I, I don't see myself having a separate agenda from the governor. I see myself working as a team member with the governor, advising her uh, as best that I can with my experience, uh, having served in the state senate. And uh, that, that's where I see myself as being uh, advantageous to our state and to our new governor. To that point that you just mentioned about having served in the Senate, uh, the Senate can be a challenging place for the lieutenant governor who oversees the affairs of the Senate while in session. Um, what would be your approach, your style, as to running the Senate from the from the chair uh, while we are in session. And, and I'm just going to be very open and point blank that uh, we are a very strong-willed body, which is not a bad thing. Uh, we have diverse uh, personalities within the chamber. That is not a bad thing. Uh, but sometimes there is, because of the nature of the environment, it can be a little bit contentious. What would be your approach to dealing with keeping decor in the chamber while debate is going on and while we are uh, handling the bills and the business of the Senate? Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> as, as you s said, Senator, I served in the Senate for eight years at a time when it was overwhelmingly a majority Democrat, seven Republicans. I've served in other capacities where I have chaired meetings, both at the state Republican Party and the Republican National Committee meetings. My goal would always be to be fair, to, to listen, to be a fair arbiter, not to show favorites, uh, to try and keep a decorum Everyone is entitled to speak and share their opinion, and certainly it does get um, uh, cantankerous. Some people get kind of cantankerous, but I think it's important to always remember that you will have your chance to speak uh, if you want 
want to speak on a particular issue. You know, the Senate uses uh, doesn't use Roberts' rules of order. Uh, it uses Mason's rules of order, and I'm familiar with that. It's a different set of rules uh, for legislative bodies. But my key would always be to show respect and that the senators show respect to each other, even if you adamantly disagree about an issue, it's not the senator that's bringing that issue that you should disagree with. We should be uh, the greatest debating body in the state of Arkansas, and to do so, we must show respect to each other. And I believe I can handle that, having been there. Uh, I'm not running for Mr. Congeniality. I'm running to be a great (laughs) lieutenant governor and to run the Senate the way that it should be run, and that will be to demand respect of each senator from each other senator. All right. Let's uh, give people a little bit of personal insight as to some of the key issues that are going on in the nation today. This past week, the Supreme Court uh, upheld at least or struck down at least part of Biden's mandate. Uh, They upheld the other part, dealing with uh, regulation of state and federal. We have, and uh, time allows today, toward the end of the program, I'm going to speak about Act 1115, which is a bill of past regarding that if you're going to be a business uh, that mandates or you as a business are forced to mandate by the federal government that employees receive the vaccination, that you have to allow avenues of testing or allow to show proof of antigen Uh, built up in your system. So the Supreme Court struck down half of it, so the businesses are out from underneath that mandate. But I just saw a news article pop up a while ago that over 3,000 Army members, members of the Army, were reprimanded uh, because they did not get the vaccine. 97% of the military are vaccinated, which means 3% are not. Now, call it conspiracy or call it reality, if I was Biden or somebody of his mentality or you know, philosophy of how to get rid of good people in government, I would force a mandate and then do exactly what's being done and get rid of a bunch of people that probably don't agree with me anyway. What is your position or what is your, uh, what are your thoughts with regards to the mandates that are coming out of the Biden administration and in your role as lieutenant governor, what do you see that you could do to make an impact uh, based on the answer you're going to give? Well, I, I do not support any government mandate, period. Okay? I do not support any government mandate uh, concerning this virus and concerning the vaccinations. I certainly appreciate and support what the legislature has done. I think it's taking into consideration individual uh uh, individuals' positions on the the virus and on on other things. We are we are we are a party that believes in individual rights and respecting individuals to uh, that they can look at the facts, make a decision what is best for their health. Okay. Uh, once again, I would speak out concerning uh, that issue as lieutenant governor in support of the Senate and of the legislature. Uh, I certainly respect the decision of the United States Supreme Court. I believe it was a correct decision uh, concerning health care workers. I believe that tied uh, significantly to Medicaid and Medicare funding to those health facilities. Uh, Once again, I support what our legislature has done, uh, and I believe it's the right course to show respect for individuals in the state. On the abortion issue, tomorrow we're going to celebrate uh, the 44th annual March for Life at the Capitol. Um, You can go up on my website. I believe I've got this up on there. And you can go to my personal web, uh, my personal Facebook page and uh, find it uh, for the March of Life tomorrow. The, you know, we're sitting here waiting for the ruling to come out in June by the Supreme Court regarding the Dobbs case down in Mississippi. And as you know, we just recently uh, adjourned without taking up the matter of um, the bill that was up for debate. Uh, Just give people your perception, your thoughts, as far as where we are in history with regards to abortion and uh, what you think the position ought to be that we as a state should be taking, giving all the moving parts that are going on. Let me first say that I, I applaud President Trump 
for his appointments to the United States Supreme Court. I don't think without his election and without his appointments, we would be where we are today. I believe that we're going to see the repeal of Roe versus Wade. Uh, it's a decision that uh, the overwhelming majority of our Kansans will support uh, and applaud, and it will put into effect uh, with the trigger uh, our uh, uh, banning abortion in the state of Arkansas, which I believe is what the people of Arkansas call on. I believe it's the right course. It's my personal belief that life begins at conception. Uh, so I applaud where we are in this uh, situation. I think that many people have worked throughout the years, and I applaud all of you that have passed uh, pro-life legislation. But if we had not become a Republican state, if we had not made the change over the past 12 years, we wouldn't be where we are today with a trigger in place preparing to repeal abortion in the state of Arkansas. So I applaud you and all of those that have been a part of that decision. I can't think of one Democrat that voted for one pro-life bill. I may be wrong on that, and I'm sure I'll be told if I am, uh, for the time that I've been down there. It seems yep. as though they're, and, and you watch that pretty closely, uh, but that is yep. the benefit of being a Republican-controlled legislature and administration when it comes to vital things like Roe versus Wade and, and the defending of the unborn. So. Uh, I would echo exactly what you said. Yeah. All right. We Senator, just, let me say quickly, in 1997, we did have some good Christian conservative Democrats who voted with us to ban partial birth abortion. Uh, but it was a miraculous thing that a lot of prayer brought about. That's right. Well, and only God can get done what's getting done. We're just the, we're just the players on the field, but he's the coach on the sideline calling the plays, and we just need to be obedient to the plays that he calls, and I think that's why we've gotten where we are. I've only got about uh, three minutes left. We just gave, the, to my knowledge, correct me if I'm wrong, you've been around a lot longer than I have, uh, we just gave the biggest tax cut in Arkansas history, nearly half a billion dollars. Uh, based on the budget hearings that are going on right now, uh, we are even going to finish with a surplus after doing all that. We know there's a lot of money coming in from the feds that are probably inflating our economic picture as a state, and we are trying to prepare for that deflation whenever it hits. Um, what would be your position or what are your thoughts as far as the economic strength of the state, uh, the tax cuts? We know that some are wanting to take it down to zero. Uh, is that realistic? Is it not? Let me just open the mic so you can share for a, a minute or a minute and a half about your, yep. your thoughts and the directions you would want to go uh, as lieutenant governor if elected with regards to tax cuts. Well, uh, Senator, once again, we are seeing the benefit of a conservative Republican government, and we must continue to move to reduce taxes, to reform government, to transform government. Uh, dollars are more beneficial in families' pockets rather than in the state uh, coffers. So I think we're headed clearly in the right direction. Uh, I think uh, we have to move in that direction to be competitive with surrounding states. I think that because of our directions, now we see a $3 billion steel mill being going to be built in Mississippi County, and Mississippi County will be the strongest steel producing county in the nation. Uh, once again, we Republicans transfer we would view it best, and that is less government, more money in people's pockets, reduce taxes. Let's make it, it's harder. It's getting a little harder to get along. Let me say that. And there seems to be some that are breaking off and going in their own direction. What is your thoughts as far as we're the Republican Party in control? What are your thoughts as far as, um, you know, people going off and starting a third party or you know, people not want to come to table to have discussions. Just what is your what are your thoughts in one minute or less about that issue? Sure. 
Well, Republicans must stand firm. We cannot compromise. It's time for the Democrats to compromise. They always try to put us in a bad position. Progressives are not progressive, okay? They're moving us into a socialistic society, and we must stand firm. If in any who break off and decide to start a third party, all they're doing is helping elect liberal to uh, socialistic Democrats. We must stay united. Uh, and I believe in following the Reagan rule. If you agree with me 80 percent of the time, you are not my 20 percent enemy. Let us move together. Let us continue to transform this state in a conservative Republican plan. All right. Thank you for having me on today, Senator. No, no, no. One question. Then we're going to go. I, ne I need to know okay. if you got your crystal ball out. Trump is having today his first rally in Arizona. It would appear that he's positioning to run for president again. What's your forecast? Do you think he will? Do you think he won't? I do, I, I do not think Trump will run, but I think that someone acceptable to him will be the nominee. I think he is playing the cards that we can sweep the Congress and the Senate and take control in preparation for 2024 when a great conservative Republican will be elected president. I don't believe it'll be Trump. I believe his family is ready for him to come home and be a good good husband and a good grandfather and a father. Uh, I, I applaud him, and I think he's doing uh, our work to transform this country. You've been listening to Dole Wed, candidate for lieutenant governor of the state of Arkansas. We're going to take a break here on the Kim Hammer Show. Dole, I appreciate you very much giving time on Saturday, and I know you're out on the campaign trail. Coming up after the break, we'll have Dr. Greg Bledsoe, who is also a candidate for the lieutenant governor position here in the state of Arkansas. Come back after the break to the Kim Hammer Show. Here now is a special message from Faithful Funeral Home, 7727 Colonel Glen Row in Little Rock, from President and CEO Edward Shelton. Hello, this is Edward Shelton. I am eternally grateful for all of you that have allowed me to serve your families in the past 40 years as a funeral director. Now I want to let you know that I am in a new dimension of life, not only as a funeral director, but as a funeral home owner. God certainly honors faithfulness. So I am here to serve you at Faithful Funeral Home, 7727 Colonel Glen Road, here in Little Rock, Arkansas. My number is 501-588-8259. At Faithful Funeral Home, service is what we do. Take the answer with you anywhere with our free mobile app, 1011fmtheanswer.com, Amazon Alexa, iHeart, or radio.com. Breaking news and stimulating talk. 101.1 FM, The Answer. Hey, we've got a little problem and wondering if you could help us out. We're in need of immediate part-time help with our radio station. This would be the perfect side hustle for someone needing some extra income or for a college or high school student interested in a career in broadcasting. If you or someone you know would want to join our team, please call Steve during business hours at 501-404-6560. That's 501-404-6560. Salem Media Group is an equal opportunity employer. Hello, I'm Mike Huckabee, and don't miss a celebration of life with Sarah Huckabee Sanders at the 2022 Bowties for Babies fundraiser for Arkansas Right to Life, Thursday, January 27th at the Benton Event Center. Get tickets by phone at 501-663-4237, online at ARTL.org, or by mail. For the second year in a row, Arkansas is the most pro-life state in the U.S. Come see why at the Pro-Life Event of the Year. Take the answer with you anywhere with our free mobile app, 1011fmtheanswer.com. Tune in, iHeart, or radio.com. Breaking news and stimulating talk. 101.1 FM, the answer. Good afternoon. Welcome back to the Kim Hammer Show. I know it's kind of a bleak day out there, but I'm glad that you're listening today. Uh, just want to make you aware of a couple events coming up. First of all, tomorrow, and it is still on, I confirm that as of this time broadcast, the Heartbeat, I'm sorry, the Heart of Arkansas Beats for Life, which is the 44th Annual March for Life, is going to be taking place here in Little Rock tomorrow at 2 o'clock. The march will begin behind the Capitol Avenue on Wolf Street. I believe I've got this up on my website, or you can go to my personal Facebook page. I've got a picture of it with all the details. It'd be a great opportunity for you to come out in this historic year that we're living with the potential of Roe versus Wade being overturned on the basis of the Dobbs case in Mississippi. It'd be a great time for you to come out and show your support. No, the weather may not be the best, but I'll tell you what, 
it'll still be a great time for you to come out and walk together as a group to support pro-life here in the state of Arkansas. On a second note, tonight at 6 o'clock at the church that I pastor, which is Celine Baptist Church down in the community of Tull, that's T-U-L-L. It's outside of Benton. You can just Google it. It'll take you right to it. It's the church right in the middle of town. We're doing a sportsman's supper. I want to put your mind at ease. We will be checking temperatures at the door, but also we had our cleaning company come in last night, and we had our buildings treated for the virus, and so uh, it has been sterilized, if you would, and we're taking every precaution to make sure that we're providing for a safe environment. Our guest speaker is going to be Dr. Sonny Tucker, who is the executive director of the Arkansas State Convention. He also is an avid outdoorsman, and he can bring a challenging uh, message or thought, if you want to call it that, uh, it'll be a great opportunity for you to come out and enjoy a great menu. Uh, we've got raccoon, we got beaver, we got gumbo, we got catfish, we've got pork butts, uh, we've got uh, just everything that you would want to have. We've got some man, you want to see some beautiful mounts. Uh, we've got about a 400 pound bear down there. Uh, we've got a bobcat with a pheasant. We got, uh, of course, deer mounts. We got duck. Uh, we got a lot of things. And and the the ladies and the men at church have really gone all out in order to decorate. We've even got the stage set up like a deer camp. And so it's really a cool environment to come down tonight at six o'clock. We're not going to charge for the meal. We'll ask for a donation. If you want to give one, that's great. And we got some super door prizes. We've got door prizes, uh, gift cards from Big Red, Bass Pro Shop, Kerry Murphy Production. Uh, Man, I tell you what, he has brought the ammo uh, that's going to be part of the door prizes. Got a great knife from Joe's Knife out of Prescott. If you've ever been to one of Kerry's productions, you know what quality knives that he puts out. Uh, we got a great knife knife to give away. We've also got some uh, free dinners to Wood Grill there in Benton. Appreciate uh, Elgin and his wife uh, donating those. And then we've got a list of other things, and I've got one super door prize uh, that will be given, but I'm not going to tell you what it is because if you're not there, you'll wish you would have been there and you'll be miserable, and I don't want to make you miserable. But if you are there, you'll be excited that you were there to have an opportunity to win it. And so that's tonight at 6 o'clock. You can go up on uh, my personal Facebook page to get any more details. And, again, it's at 6 o'clock. Doors open at 530. We did say that we would be doing a skeet shoot last week. I said that, but with the weather the way it is, uh, just isn't going to work out. Uh, but we are going to have a great time indoors in a very safe environment. All right, moving on now uh, on the Kim Hammer Show. I've got Dr. Greg Bledsoe on, who is also a candidate for the lieutenant governor position here in the state of Arkansas. Dr. Bledsoe, thank you for taking time out to be on the Kim Hammer Show this afternoon. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Great. Hey, uh, first of all, let me just start by giving you an open mic to tell about your background as far as involvement in politics. It is a political office that you're running for. Um, you know, first time you're putting your toe in the water or what's your past experience so that people kind of have an idea about your background in the world of politics. Sure. sure. Well, I grew up in the town of Rogers, Arkansas, and I remember in 1986, my parents did something that seemed really radical at the time. I was 13 years old and they put a yard sign for a uh, Republican candidate in our yard. And we'd never been involved in politics before. But all through my, my time as a student, I was involved in volunteering for conservative Republicans running for office. We were some of the first supporters for Mike Huckabee, for instance, when he ran for U.S. Senate in 92 and then later as lieutenant governor and governor. And I went on. Uh, I was involved in politics throughout high school and college. I was an intern at the Heritage Foundation in Washington, D.C., actually uh, interned for the president of the Heritage Foundation and interned in Washington, D.C. under Congressman Tim Hutchinson, my congressman from northwest Arkansas. Um, and you know, since then, I've been involved sort of peripherally in policy uh, just because of being the Surgeon General and uh, been a donor and a supporter of a number of conservative Republicans in the state. But, um, I, you know, I, I'm a little bit different as a candidate because I'm not a career politician. I've never run for office before, as you mentioned. And I really uh, feel strongly that we need private sector folks and people who aren't career politicians involved in the political process. I think in Arkansas, uh, we do a great job of, of creating good families and have a lot of strong leaders and people in the private sector. And I think there's more than three or four people who are in this state who could run for higher office and do a great job. So I'm, I'm volunteering my services as a candidate, and we'll see what happens. As far as what makes you qualified to be lieutenant governor, what would you say are your qualifications uh, to step into the role as lieutenant governor? Well, I think that's a great question, and I think when people are thinking of political office, 
I think the mistake that some people make is, is that they say, well, you have to be a politician to hold a political office. And I just fundamentally disagree with that. I think when you look at political office, the way our system was designed by our founders was that the people would be private citizens who had private sector experience, who stepped in and served the public for a period of time, and then came back and lived under the laws that they made. And I just think that's the way that we should get back to. I mean, what, what our system was designed uh, to support is citizen volunteers who volunteer for the public service and then go back and become private citizens again. So, you know, my background is in the private sector. I'm a physician. Uh, I've been the medical director of an emergency department. I've run emergency departments. I've held executive leadership positions in a variety of organizations. I started a medical education company. I'm a founder and CEO, and I've seen how difficult it is to be a small business leader in the times of, for instance, the recession, uh, and how difficult it is to make payroll. And I've worked uh, with a variety of leaders, uh, you know, hospital CEOs, business CEOs, others in the private sector dealing with things like COVID. And so, you know, when you look at my background, I'm not a, I'm not a politician. I don't have political experience, but I have a lot of experience where I think it matters most, and that's private sector experience. And then the other thing I would say is it's very important that we have people who have high levels of integrity and honesty and love the state. And so if you're a private sector person who loves the state of Arkansas and has a high level of integrity, I think you're qualified to run for office in the state. The, you hit on something there that I wanted to ask you about. You are currently, correct me if I'm wrong, sorry, man, sometimes I'm less find out. You're still Surgeon <laughs> General, right? <laughs> Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. As far as I know, as far as I know. <laughs> when you woke up this morning, you were Surgeon General, right? Yes, sir. All right. Yes, sir. Hey, sorry, guys, if you're watching Facebook, you know, I just, I am what I am. All right. So being, <laughs> being a Surgeon General and, and uh, being a, you know, a ER doc and all the other things you do, how in the world are you going to hold up to the demands of also being a Lieutenant Governor and be able to fulfill? Of course, I know if you're, you know, Lieutenant Governor, you won't be Surgeon General, but Right. How are how are you going to hold up to the demands? Uh, because, granted, it is a part time position. Um, you know, we're part time legislators, so I heard. Um, but <laughs> it's it's kind of like a part time preacher. You're twenty four seven on call, what, regardless of wherever you get paid. How you how are you going to manage that uh, situation? Well, that's that's a great question. So, as an emergency physician, I do shift work, so I don't have my own clinic or my own practice that I'm managing. I sign up for a certain number <laughs> of shifts a month. And I can toggle that number of shifts up and down depending on the needs of the hospital and the needs, uh, you know, the other demands that I have on my time. And so that's an advantage that I have as, a, as an emergency physician that other physicians don't have. So if I'm elected lieutenant governor, then what I would do is during the sessions, I would toggle down my clinical shifts, but I would continue to practice. Um, and I would be able to uh, be available for the duties of lieutenant governor. And you know, it, it, it does seem a little busy, but the fact is, is that I've been busy since I was, you know, in high school. I've, you know, I've done a lot of various things, and even a lot of people don't realize that in 2019, I started my MBA. So I, I started it, and six months into my MBA, COVID hit, and I was still able to finish my MBA even in spite of COVID and all the other things I was doing. So I'm used to, to balancing a lot of different things and wearing a lot of different hats, and so I uh, while it might be challenging at times, I think I'm up to the task of being both a physician and lieutenant governor. So let me ask you this question. Uh, when I when I ran uh, for my seat as a House representative, there were there were two votes I had to get before I worried about anybody else. Uh, one was God, and the other one was my wife. Uh, God got there before my wife. She she came around, and when she <laughs> when she finally said, and I'll never forget when she said it and where we were when she said it. But when she finally came around, she said, if that's what you feel you need to do, I'll support you. Um, yeah. How how uh, much support do you have out of your household? Because that that is Great critical question. that when you're in a public servant position like we are and paying the price that is often at the expense of our families, uh, it can put a real strain on the family. So what is it that you had your aha moment where you said, you know, I'm going to run for lieutenant governor? and the support yep. you got? That's a great question, and I'm glad you brought that up because foundationally I'm a Christian first and foremost. And when I was looking at this race, we, my family and I, my wife and I, spent a lot of time praying about it and thinking about it. And it originally started about two years ago when people started coming to me and asking me to consider it. And I remember those first discussions with my wife, and I said, you know, I think we should think about this. What, what do you think? And she said, <laughs> I think that's a terrible idea. 
you know, you're not a politician. And um, your wife and my wife talked, you. but anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, so we, I just, you know, you know, to your point, that that sort of ended it for me because if my wife wasn't going to be on board, uh, I wasn't going to go forward with it. But we continued to pray about it. And what really changed was when COVID hit, I started doing a lot of Zoom meetings from my home office, which is what a lot of people did. Um, you know, doing a lot of remote uh, sort of uh, meetings and and uh, and projects. And in my home office, the other side of my home office is our workout area. So my wife would come in and she would work out on the other side of the room. And, and sometimes she could overhear some of the meetings and the discussions and the decisions. And this went on for weeks. And I, I didn't realize that she was paying attention at all or even listening. And um, a, a few weeks into the, the COVID pandemic, she pulled me aside and she said, you know, I've been listening to these discussions and you have something different that a lot of people in government don't have, and that's that you have private sector experience, you're a leader, you're able to help people think through things in a, in a unique way. And she said, I, I think you need to run. You've got something that's unique that you can offer the state. And that was my aha moment, as you said, uh, where I felt like, okay, I've got a green light to do this. Um, but we feel very much called to this. We don't know what the outcome is going to be. Uh, and we're just trying to be faithful to what the Lord's shown us. And so what, that's sort of our goal is to, you know, follow the cloud where it leads. And uh, the Lord's led us to this. We're going to be faithful, and, you know, we'll see what happens when the when the votes are passed. What's going to, what are going to be your goals as lieutenant governor? And as I uh, said to Doyle a while ago, the, you know, we had discussions in the past. It may come up in the future that we would want to make the governor and lieutenant governor a ticket uh, package so that, uh, you vote for one, you vote for the other, just like with the president, vice president, your your ability to be too aggressive in what you may have in the way of a desire is going to be tempered some by, somewhat by the fact that while you're a separate constitutional officer, you still have to play nice with the governor and have to get along with the governor, even if you have strong mm -hmm. differences. What are your goals that you would want to uh, see carried out as lieutenant governor, first of all? Well, great point. And I think the number one thing that lieutenant governor does, you know, the lieutenant governor role in Arkansas doesn't have a lot of authority in the sense of you're not appointing a lot of people, you don't have a big staff, but you do have a big microphone. And so the number one uh, role in my mind for lieutenant governor is selling the state, representing the state, representing the people of Arkansas, and selling our state to uh, not just the people in Arkansas, but to people outside of Arkansas. And so you don't want to have someone in that position who's going to be a distraction or a detriment to the state, or use the office for simply personal gain uh, or to promote themselves. And to that point, I think it's a very important thing that you're able to get along with and work on. We lost him. All right. I'll tell you what, uh, Greg, you're probably listening. Something happened to the call. Just call back in. And while we're waiting for him to call back in, um, let me, let me, Go ahead and give a couple public service announcements. Y'all be patient. This is what you do with live radio. I'm going to send him a message real quick. Tell him to give me a call back in. And while he does, I want to tell you about tomorrow. Um, hang on a second. Okay. Tomorrow, we have the heartbeat of Arkansas, or we have the heart of Arkansas Beats for Life. It's the 44th annual March for Life. It's going to be held at the Capitol grounds on uh, tomorrow at 2 o'clock. And you can gather up behind the Capitol, and the march will begin at Capitol Avenue and Wolf Street, and we'll march up to the Capitol. They'll have some speakers. I know the weather's going to be a little bit of uh, uh, inclement, uh, inclement weather, but we want you to come out anyway in support of really good cause, especially with what's going on this year while we wait for the Supreme Court and Roe versus Wade uh, to be dealt with uh, under, you know, under the uh, Dobbs. Uh, bill that's going on down there in Mississippi. Make that a matter of prayer if you would. We want the Supreme Court to do what's right. Second thing is, I want to remind you, um, and the second thing is that, uh, and just so you know, Greg's trying to call back in. Something's gone on evidently with the cell phone service, so y'all just sit tight and be patient with me, okay? But tonight uh, at Sling Baptist Church, which is the church that I pastor, we're having a sportsman's supper and our speaker is going to be Dr. Sonny Tucker, Executive Director of the Arkansas State Convention, uh, who also is an avid, doors, uh, avid outdoorsman. And uh, the meal tonight is going to include a selection. If you got the stomach for it, we've got, uh, we got some raccoon, we've got some beaver, 
Uh, we got the good old fashioned pork butts from some wild uh, wild hogs. We've got the potato salad, and then we've got catfish for those of you that don't feel that you can stomach it. Uh, that starts at six o'clock tonight. The doors will open at five thirty. We've got some really good sponsors that are going to be helping out with that. Uh, as far as the table sponsors, uh, Senator or Senator Matt Pitch, who's running for uh, treasurer of the state of Arkansas. One of our table sponsors, Senator Alan Clark, who actually represents the district down there that my church is in, is helping out tonight. We have gift cards uh, from Bass Pro Shop, Big Red, uh, Carrie Murphy Productions. Carrie provided quite a bit of ammunition, as a matter of fact, uh, which is hard to get today. So you might want to come just to be able to get your chance to win some of that. We have uh, a knife, a really nice knife, uh, from Joe's Knife out of Prescott. And then also we have, as I mentioned, gift cards from Big Reds and Bass Pro Shop. Also, we got some free dinners uh, from Wood Grill there in Benton. So one of the things I also want to point out is that, as you may know, recently with the uh, last session that we uh, voted not to uh, extend in order to take up some bills, and I was actually going to do this toward the end of the show, but let me go ahead and do it now because Greg is telling me uh, that he, evidently, there's something happened with the cell phones because he can't get the call back in. So I will have him back on if he doesn't make it back in for us to finish our conversation with him. But one of the things I want you to know, and this is in regards to what happened toward the end of the special session that we had where there was an effort to introduce a resolution that would have extended the session for the purpose of taking up several things. One of those things that would have been taken up was the discussion of a Texas-style bill dealing with abortion. And I have prepared a letter uh, that I'm going to put up on my website, which is the thekimhammershow.com, thekimhammershow.com. I'm going to post this letter. It'll probably be later today, maybe this evening, so you can be watching for it. And I'm going to go ahead and begin to read the letter just so you can have a little bit of a taste. It's about a four-page letter, and it gives a perspective as to some of the reasons why some of us felt it wasn't in the best interest to extend the session for taking up a Texas-style pro-life bill. Now, tomorrow we are all going to gather together, and we are going to march for life at 2 o'clock at the Capitol. And many of us that are in the legislature are as pro-life as anybody else that's in the legislature, but we had a difference of opinion when it came to extending the session for the purpose of taking up another pro-life bill. So there are two major abortion cases working their way through the federal courts today. First, a Mississippi law with her prohibition on abortions more than 15 weeks after pregnancy has been argued before the U.S. Supreme Court. The case, which is Dobbs, directly challenges Roe versus Wade. The Supreme Court may overturn the Mississippi law under Roe or may limit Roe's viability language, which has the effect of allowing the prohibition of abortions more than 24 weeks after gestation. Alternatively, the Supreme Court could overturn Roe v. Wade entirely as the state of Mississippi sought in its filing, a decision expected by the end of June. A separate case out of Texas, Whole Women's Health, concerns a prohibition on abortions more than six weeks after pregnancy with a private means of enforcement. We all have celebrated unprecedented good results of the Texas heartbeat abortion law. Those of us in the fight for preservation of human life cannot argue with the fact that many abortions have been prevented in Texas since the passage of their law. A December Supreme Court ruling has allowed a legal challenge to proceed in the federal court against the Texas law. A few states, including Arkansas, have enough pro-life legislation or support in their state legislature that a Texas-type abortion law could pass here as well. It may be tempting to rush out and pass a Texas-type abortion law, but patience, prudence, and also conservatism, excuse me, and conservative fiscal discipline with states' funds dictate otherwise. Here are some good reasons that Arkansas should not attempt to pass a Texas-type abortion law right now. First of all, the passage of a Texas-type abortion law in Arkansas is unlikely to have an immediate effect, so it won't stop any abortions right now. On December 10, 2021, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the Texas law may be challenged in court. Further proceedings are ongoing. If Arkansas passes a Texas-type abortion law, the ACLU, 
Planned Parenthood, and other organizations that promote killing babies in the womb will almost certainly challenge the law as soon as it is passed. Once challenged, an Arkansas law would go before U.S. District Judge Christy Baker or another federal judge. Based on the outcome in the Texas lawsuit, as with other pro-life laws, an Arkansas version of the Texas abortion law would almost certainly be subject to a lawsuit immediately before any abortions were stopped. With an expensive and indeterminate outcome for the state and for the unborn babies. The second reason is the enforcement mechanism in the Texas law purportedly upends our system of justice, some say, and in the future may be used against Christians, conservatives, and others who are pro-life. For example, elected officials in California are already proposing anti-gun legislation that gives anyone standing to sue any maker or distributor of certain firearms. Liberal state legislature, secondly, could pass laws requiring pregnancy centers to provide women with abortion information. Not sure about that one. Liberal state legislatures could pass laws against hate speech. Even though these laws violate the First Amendment, a law allowing citizens to sue those who violate it could enable them to get around the protections found in the First Amendment. The fourth reason. A Texas-type abortion law passed in Arkansas could promote an out-of-state lib- or could promote out-of-state liberals, their big-money donors, and progressives in Arkansas to try to turn this concept against our freedoms of religion, speech, or assembly by passing laws against their freedoms and give individuals the right to sue anyone who tries to exercise their God-given rights. The Texas abortion law is still in court with multiple ongoing legal challenges and may be struck down or enjoined, otherwise suspended, at any time. If Arkansas passes the same law before the courts rule on it, our law could be struck down on the same grounds as the Texas law since the U.S. Supreme Court has said parts of the law can go forward. Arkansans would have to pay for the opposing attorneys and the effect on the unborn would be negligible. It makes sense for Arkansas and other states to wait for the courts to rule on the validity of the Texas law, which has miles to go before it finally is resolved by the courts and proceeds from there. A U.S. Supreme Court ruling this June in the Mississippi case could render the Texas-type abortion law unnecessary. By June of 2022, the U.S. Supreme Court is scheduled to release its ruling in the Dobbs case. Many experts believe the court may overturn Roe v. Wade. If this happens, under current Arkansas law, abortions would become illegal in Arkansas as soon as their decision is handed down. A Texas-type abortion law in Arkansas would cloud the legal interpretation and understanding of current Arkansas abortion laws if the Supreme Court reverses Roe v. Wade in June. The enforcement mechanisms in the Texas-style laws would be a significant change to the Arkansas law. All of the Arkansas's existing pro-life law are enforced in the same way through criminal protection, professional licensing, government rules, and civil liability for the individual who has been injured, allowing anyone in the U.S. or state to file a lawsuit as a means of enforcing is unorthodox and could complicate the definite prohibitions of Arkansas's existing abortion laws if Roe C. Wade, Roe versus Wade is overturned in June. The enforcement mechanisms in the Texas type abortion bill are inconsistent with Arkansas abortion law enforcement mechanisms and a new set of legal challenges in the court could result in unfavorable rulings against our good laws based on some reasoning conjured up by a shrewd liberal judge or out of state abortion mill proponents. A better use of resources would have Arkansas focus on providing funds for emergency resource centers for pregnant women, as has been done for years in Texas. We are, as a state, behind. And before we jump on the Texas bandwagon, the state should focus its resources on supporting the women who most need it by funding emergency resource centers. You can go up to my website, thekimhammershow.com. I'll have this letter. I've got to get it grammatically corrected to just make sure everything's right before I put it out to the public. But I'll have it up there over the weekend. You can go up to thekimhammershow.com and read the letter in its entirety. Remember, tomorrow at 2 o'clock, Capitol, 
the 44th annual March for Life. And again, tonight, if you want to come on down to Tull, Arkansas, for the Wildlife Supper, I promise you, you'll have a great time. It'll be safe as well. We'll be checking temperatures. We had the place uh, fumigated last night, so we've taken every precaution that we can to make sure you have a safe time. This is Kim Hammer Show. I'll join you back next week with some more candidates and getting back on Dr. Greg Bledsoe. One hundred one point one FM, The Answer, KDXE FM, Kamak Village, Little Rock, a Salem Media Group station. One hundred.